Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we'll talk about uh, matching in graphs which is an important uh, algorithmic problem and also important combinatorial concept. So what's a matching? Uh, a matching is simply a subset of edges such that no two edges in that set share a common vertex. Okay, so uh, formally it's just a set of edges such that if you took any two edges in the matching, remember edges themselves are sets of size two, um, and the, the, those edges do not intersect. They do not share a common vertex unless the edges are the same. Okay. So why is it called a matching? Because it, you know, if you uh, have an edge, um, if you have a vertex uh, that uh, has an edge incident on it, that's the only edge that can be incident on it, and that edge matches this vertex with the other endpoint of the edge. So you could think of a matching as picking uh, pairs of, uh, you know, trying to partition the uh, set of nodes into uh, pairs, but you may not be able to match every, you need not match every vertex. There could be some vertices that are left unmatched. So every vertex is either matched with a unique partner or they're left unmatched. Okay, so that's what uh, a matching does. There are trivial matchings. You could um, take the empty set of uh, edges. That's clearly a matching. Uh, but a little more interestingly, you could take a single edge. And that is always guaranteed to be a valid matching. Okay. But of course, that's a very uh, small matching. What we are usually interested in um, is to be able to ideally match every uh, vertex with someone, some other vertex. And that would be called a perfect matching. So every node. Uh, in the graph is matched uh, with some other node. So the, the set uh, M uh, touches the set of uh, edges um, in M touches every vertex. Okay? Um, so that would be a perfect matching that may or may not exist in a, uh, in a graph. Um, and the algorithm task is to, uh, that is associated with matching, is to try and find the largest matching or as large a matching as um, you can. And in fact, you can find the largest matching pretty efficiently. Um, so unlike some of the other graph problems we have discussed like Hamiltonian cycle or um, you know, graph coloring, um, here there's a problem which does have efficient algorithms. We will not discuss these algorithms in this course, uh, but uh, you, know, you should know that this is a problem which is tractable. Uh, matchings are especially more interesting in bipartite graphs. Um, and uh, so here is a bipartite graph. Uh, so I'm going to denote bipartite graphs um, uh, using a slightly different notation now. So remember, there are two subsets of uh, vertices, a partition of vertices into two sets. Um, so calling those sets X and Y here, and all the edges go across the two uh, parts. Um, so I, I have my notation here is to denote um, the two parts explicitly and the edge set where the edges are going. Um, you know, each edge has exactly one node in X and one node in Y. Okay. Uh, now, in a bipartite matching, here again, you know, your goal would be to find as large matching as possible. And the most you could ask for is a complete matching from, so suppose the, you know, one of the parts here, X is uh, strictly smaller than the part Y, then you cannot hope to have a perfect matching because there are not enough uh, partners for, you know, uh, the nodes in Y for each of them to be matched against, um, uh, you know, without um, collisions. Uh, but you could hope for having everybody on the left matched with some other, somebody on the right in this case, because the left hand side is uh, smaller than the right hand side. Okay, 
So that's called a complete matching. If you are able to find a valid matching such that uh, everybody uh, on the left gets matched with someone. So in this case, here is an example of a, a complete matching. Everybody here has an edge going out of them, exactly one edge going out of them. And um, it is a valid matching because no uh, node here is getting two edges coming onto them. So they are all getting uh, one edge, if at all. There are a few that are left without um, any uh, edges incident on them. And that's because the size of the matching in this case is bounded by the size of x. And if y uh, has, say, here, three more elements than x, then it's uh, bound to be the case that there will be three elements in y, three nodes in y, which will not be matched uh, by any match. Okay, uh, so this is a complete matching. Again, a complete matching may or may not exist. Um, and uh, it can exist only if you know, a complete matching from x to y can exist only if uh, x is less than or equal to y. And uh, you know, uh, again, it may not exist even if x is less than or equal to y. Um, and yeah, the size of the matching is at most the size of x and the size of y, uh, but it could be, uh, you know, there may not be such a matching uh, in all cases. If x and y are of the same size, then a complete matching is the same thing as a perfect matching, and that matching will, um, you know, uh, touch every node here and every node here. So. It's a complete matching both ways. It's also a perfect matching as we defined um, uh, in the previous slide. So, so th th this is a matching problem in bipartite graphs. Um, why do we care? So here are a few examples of um, uh, problems where you would want to solve uh, matching in bipartite graphs. So consider the question of uh, assigning tasks to workers. So tasks could be programs and workers could be processes on which those programs need to be run. Um, or, you know, it could be uh, various other things. Um, and you could model this as a bipartite graph with tasks on one side and workers on the other side. And you put an edge between a worker and a task if the worker is capable of doing the task. So, you know, not all processes may be able to run um, all the programs um or in, in in the case of uh, human workers not every worker may be qualified for every task so you put an edge if uh, it is okay to assign uh, this worker to this task then you put an edge between the worker and the task uh, and then when you're doing the assignment your goal is that um, you know each worker should be assigned only one task um, and each task needs uh, only one worker. Okay, a, a task once assigned to one worker doesn't need um, more work on it. Okay, so um, this is a this, you know this is a special uh, case of a scheduling problem. Um, it's a one-shot problem. You just assign a bunch of tasks to a bunch of workers. Each worker getting at most one task. Each task assigned to at most one worker. And um, the goal is, uh, you know, so given the constraints of um, uh, uh, these qualifications and uh, or even how many workers are available and how many tasks are there, you may not be able to uh, find a perfect matching. You may not be able to uh, assign one task um, for every worker and vice versa. So the goal would be to maximize um, the common good. So you'd like to have as many tasks um, done as possible. So you'd like to maximize the number of tasks that are assigned. You might also think in terms of, you know, giving as much employment as possible. So you want to keep all the workers um, busy. Um, and, you know, uh, either way, what you're trying to do is uh, find uh, as big a matching as possible. Okay, So uh, this would be an instance of uh, solving the maximum matching problem. Uh, another uh, example that shows up all the time nowadays is uh, um, advertisements on online pages, for instance. 
So you have a lot of advertisements and they need to be, uh, you know, say you're a company like Google who is serving ads. Um, you would like to place these ads on uh, web pages that are being viewed uh, by, you know, uh, by people. And um, each advertisement has a certain number of, uh, or rather in this case, they, they have some preferences as to which websites you know, it can be shown on, right? So not every advertisement may be willing to be put, uh, not every advertiser may be willing to have their advertisement put on every page. So um, they would give some constraints as to this advertisement is okay for these pages. And conversely, you know, um, yeah, so there, there, there could be compatibility, right? Um, and uh, if a page and, um, uh, advertisement are compatible, you might want to assign that advertisement to that page, but let's say every advertisement is to be assigned to only one page. Um, and, uh, you know, you would like to maximize the number of slots that are filled. So again, it's a matching, maximum matching problem. Now you might realize that I was simplifying it a little, um, you know, it might be okay to have the same advertisement applied to multiple pages. Um, and it's also the case that page pages, you know, are being viewed. Um, so it's not a static uh, set of uh, page views. So um, you could have additional issues in your um, uh, in your matching problem. Uh, you might have uh, weights in the matching. So certain matchings are you would like to maximize. You know, so maybe the advertiser is paying you more, so you would like to maximize your um, uh, income. Um, so you would like to maximize the weight. On the other hand, um, maybe you need to pay to get your ad placed somewhere, then there's a cost. Uh, you need to pay the web page. Um, so then you, there's a cost for um, the matching. Um, so then you would like to minimize the cost. Um, there is also this issue of pages coming in, uh, you know, it's not a static set of uh, advertisements or pages. And that corresponds to what's called an online matching uh, problem. So there are, of course, you know, more complications um, that could show up in um, various problems, but the basic problem is already very useful. A basic problem of finding maximum matching is already useful in solving many uh, real life problems, and um, and there are efficient algorithms for these problems. Okay, so uh, what we are going to see today are certain very interesting properties of uh, matching. In fact, in particular, one important theorem called Hall's theorem uh, about matching in bipartite graphs. But before getting to uh, stating or proving the theorem, let me introduce the notion of uh, what I call a shrinking neighborhood. So what is a neighborhood in a graph? Um, so given a graph and the vertex in the graph, I will define the vert that vertex, uh, vertex is a neighborhood as the set of all u such that uh, u is connected to this vertex by an edge, right? So this, uh, gamma is what I'm going to use to denote the neighborhood. Uh, gamma of um, of V or a set containing only V is a set of all nodes uh, which are connected to V by an edge. And uh, you, as you might suspect, the reason I wrote it as gamma of a set is because I could then uh, talk more generally about gamma of uh, uh, you know a set other than a singleton set. So for any subset of vertices, I will just define gamma of that subset as uh, uh, you know any node which is adjacent to any node in s would be considered part of the neighborhood of s okay so it's a union not an intersection so you uh, you know so u is included in the neighborhood of s there is some v such that u is a neighbor of v um, yeah, so that's a union of neighborhoods of all the elements in the set S. 
Now, um, what we are going to talk about um, is neighborhoods in bipartite graphs. So, in bipartite graphs, if you pick an area, if I, you know, say bipartite graph x, y, e, um, you pick a subset in completely on one side. So, s is completely in one side. Um, its neighborhood is completely in the other side, right? So, gamma s is a subset of y. And an interesting property. Uh, of um, the neighborhood is whether the neighborhood is smaller than uh, the original set S or not. So I'll say S is shrinking if its neighborhood is strictly smaller than itself. Okay. Um, and a little more generally, I will say S is shrinking in B that B is some subset of Y. So restricted to some subset of Y. I will check if the neighborhood of S, you know, restricted to this subset B um, is smaller than S or not. Okay, so gamma S intersection B, if it is smaller than S, then I will say S is shrinking in B. Okay. Uh, yeah, so set of neighbors of S, in, within B is a smaller set than S itself. Okay, so why do I care about uh, shrinking, uh, you know, sets with uh, shrinking neighborhoods or uh, shrinking sets? Um, and that's because of this uh, very useful theorem called Hall's theorem. It characterizes when you can have a complete matching in a bipartite graph. So, uh, so I'm always Going to consider you know x is uh, less than or equal to y, and I'm interested in um, complete matching from x to y. Okay, uh, of course the theorem applies even if uh, x uh, is larger than y, then um, you know uh, this condition cannot be satisfied. So the condition here is, uh, or the statement here is that x there is a complete matching from x to y if and only if no subset of x is shrinking. Okay, so that's why I wanted to define shrinking. So no subset of X uh, is shrinking uh, is a necessary and sufficient condition for a complete matching to exist. Right? So no shrinking subset uh, of X uh, is a characterization of when a complete matching exists. So we'll see, uh, you know, why this will be useful in proving other things uh, later on. But you know, for now, I just want you to understand the statement of the theorem, and we are going to see the proof for this. Okay. So the statement is an if and only if condition, and one direction is um, uh, simple. So the easy direction is showing that it's necessary that there is, there is no shrinking subset. So if there is a complete matching, it's necessary that there is no shrinking subset. Okay, so complete matching implies that no subset is shrinking. So why is that? Why is it the easy direction? Well, you know, take any subset here, and what is its neighborhood? So we want to make sure the neighborhood is at least as big as the set. Well, it neighborhood neighborhood contains for sure, you know, all the edges. Um, adjacent to it, and particularly all the edges adjacent to it via the edges in the matching. So, if there is a complete matching, there are edges leaving um, uh, you know, every element in the set S. And so, wherever they reach, they, are, they will be part of the neighborhood. And what further do we know? All these neighbors that you find in this way, they're all distinct. The, uh, so, you know, every element here has its own um, unique partner on the other side via this matching. So of course the neighborhood can, could contain more things, right? So here these uh, yellow nodes are also neighborhood are in the neighborhood of uh, S, but at least these orange nodes are guaranteed to be part of the neighborhood and that is as many as the set S itself. Okay, so if you have a complete matching, you are guaranteed that no set can no subset can shrink because its neighborhood has to contain um, their partners, and uh, there will be as many partners as uh, 
there are uh, elements in this address. Okay, so there is there cannot be a shrinking subset. What is interesting is the other direction, saying that okay, this condition, which is an EC, you know, uh, ne necessary condition, an EC consequence of there being a complete matching. Actually, it's sufficient if you just check this condition. Suppose, um, I mean, of course, I'm not saying that checking it is uh, an efficient thing to do, but it's a conceptually simple thing to do. You go around and check every subset, uh, look at their neighborhood see if that set is shrinking or not. And if it is not shrinking for every subset, then you're guaranteed that there will be a match. And that you know, should sound like magic, right? We didn't really do any matching. We didn't, um, uh, you know, it doesn't look like we did anything algorithmic there by just checking every subset um, uh, is not shrinking. But actually, it implies that there has to be a matching um, that we can carefully pick the edges such that um, you know, there's a complete match. Okay, so let's see why that's the case. Um, so the claim again is a sufficiency condition that if there is no uh, shrinking subset, then there must exist a complete matching from x uh, into y. Yeah, we are going to do induction on the size of x. We don't care about the size of y. Um, so we'll start off by x equal to 1. So in this case, I'm claiming it's obvious that uh, this condition, no shrinking subset, implies that there is a matching from x to y. So what is a matching from x to y going to look like? It's a single edge because x has a single element. Um, how are we guaranteed that there will be a single edge? Well, if there was no edge from uh, this element, then its neighborhood is empty, and that would be a shrinking. Uh, subset, right? the entire set would be a shrinking subset. Um, so, uh, you know, since there are no shrinking subsets, that means this um, uh, has an edge. This one element in X has an edge in the Y, okay? and that will be the matching. All right, so that's a base case. Um, how about the induction step? So, suppose the claim holds for graphs with uh, size of, uh, you know, uh, X up to K. Okay, so the claim is that. Um, no shrinking subset implies there's a complete matching. This holds for, suppose this holds for um, x's which are of size less than or equal to k. Now we would like to prove the same for um, the subsets for x of size k plus 1. Okay? So suppose somebody gives us a graph, an arbitrary graph, um, a bipartite graph with size of x here equal to k plus 1. And with this um, condition, right, the no shrinking subset condition. So for any subset u, um, so I'm calling it u now, the neighborhood is no smaller than u itself. The neighborhood of u is no smaller than u itself. Okay, so suppose we're given such a graph. We'll consider two cases. Um, oh, first of all, yeah, we'll pick a, a, a node x, right? We'll pick an arbitrary node x. And um, we'll consider uh, it has an arbit, you know, we'll pick an and an arbitrary neighbor for x. It's called y. Okay. So why are we guaranteed that x has a neighbor? Because um, otherwise it would be a shrinking subset. So you can pick an arbitrary node and then you're guaranteed that it will have an arbitrary neighbor. So let's pick those two things. So there's my x, there's my y, and you know, keep them aside. And if you Keep them aside, you'll get a graph of a smaller size, a smaller size for x, right? x less than or equal to k. So you can imagine, you know, that would um, be useful in doing the induction proof. Okay, uh, but it's not as uh, straightforward as that. We, uh, uh, you know, so we'll consider two cases. So first one is if we got lucky. So I remove this uh, edge, uh, you know, keep aside this edge with x and y. And uh, I got lucky and what is remaining here actually has a perfect matching or rather a complete matching into uh, what is remaining on the right. So there's a complete matching from x difference x to y difference y. Then I am done. Then, you know, I just, uh, add this one edge to that matching and this will be a complete matching for my um, 
original graph. Okay. Okay. So that'll be the lucky case if I got lucky in picking the right kind of x and y, then um, I'd get lucky. But that's of course not guaranteed. What happens if um, x my uh, x difference x does not have a complete matching to y difference y? Okay. And this is where I'm going to use my induction hypothesis to argue. So this is actually a case that is possible. But I'm going to argue that when this happens, I will be able to find some other matching, the matching that will not involve this uh, edge. Okay, so let's see that. Um, so, so what we are told is that this x difference x uh, does not have a complete matching into y difference y, which means by the induction hypothesis, there must be a uh, uh, a shrinking subset because the induction hypothesis said if there is no shrinking subset in this new graph, uh, then there would be a perfect match, right? Because the new graph is smaller. Okay, so that's why, uh, you know, that's first place where I'm using the induction hypothesis. In this smaller graph, if there is no um, uh, matching, it must be the case that there is a shrinking set S. Okay, so there is a shrinking set. S in uh, x difference x, and it's shrinking in y difference y. Okay, so I have um, a set S, and if you look at its neighborhood um, in y difference y, that would be strictly smaller than S. Okay, that's the only reason that you cannot. I mean, that that's an uh, uh, that's guaranteed if uh, there is no complete match. So remember this this is a contrapositive of uh, the way, uh, um, you know, the, what the claim we are trying to prove, the claim we said is that if there is no shrinking subsets, then there is a, a matching. I'm using it as a contrapositive saying, if there is no matching, then there must be a shrinking subset. Okay. And I can use this because um, the new X that I'm looking at is less than or equal to K in size. So the induction hypothesis does let me uh, tell me that there is a shrinking subset. Okay. On the other hand, I know that this graph, it's the original graph itself, does not have any shrinking subsets. Okay. So this S, you know, it's shrinking in y difference y, but it cannot be shrinking in y, right? Because that's our uh, kind of graph we are uh, starting with. So what? What can, how can that happen? So if I looked at all the neighborhood, all the neighbors of set S, um, it's, it's at least as large as S, but if I kept this one uh, little y out, then it's strictly shrinking. So it must be the case that, um, you know, this size of the uh, uh, neighborhood, except with y is, only one less than the size of uh, S, so that when I put this uh, Y back in, it becomes non-shrinking, it becomes as big as S, okay? So it must be the case that um, the neighborhood of S and the whole of Y should be exactly the same size of as S. Um, and, you know, when you delete, when you remove the node Y, if you look at Y difference Y, it is strictly shrinking. Um, and so remember, we are already told that every set S uh, is non-shrinking in Y. So it is at least, it's greater than or equal to S. That is what is given here. What I managed to conclude by picking this S, which is shrinking in Y minus Y, is that, um, you know, for this S, it is actually equal. It's not greater than or equal. The size of the neighborhood is equal to the size of S. Okay. So this is all I need from this uh, X and Y now. So going forward, I'm just going to use this fact that there is some set S such that its neighborhood is exactly the same size as S. So it's um, we guarantee that it was non-shrinking, but now it's also non-expanding. It's exactly equal to that size. Okay, so suppose we have this. Now I'm going to get a matching. How do I do that? I do that in two parts. First, I find a matching, a complete matching. Uh, from, so I want to find a complete matching from X into Y. I'm going to first find a complete matching from X into the neighborhood of uh, S. 
So why is that possible? Well, actually, there's something um, possible for any set, any subset of x, any strict subset of x, not just um, s. And that's from the induction hypothesis. You know, if you just look within this uh, s and uh, y, what do we know? Uh, s is a uh, set which is less than or equal to k because we kept out uh, x, uh, right? So s is strictly smaller than x. And um, no subset of S is shrinking in the whole graph because uh, you know every subset is not shrinking. So subsets of S are also not shrinking. Uh, so by induction hypothesis, I get that if I look only at the graph, you know, S and Y, graph restricted to S and Y, there is a complete matching from S into Y. But a complete matching from S into Y should actually be a matching from S into the neighborhood of S because you know, in, uh, S can be matched only with its neighbors. Elements in S, S can be matched only with their neighbors. So, um, you know, this matching is from S into gamma S and it is a complete match. Okay. So, this is the easy part. Uh, I could find a complete matching of S into gamma S. What is left is to find a complete matching of x difference s into y difference gamma s. So it's important that you know in uh, if, if there was a if I picked a matching from uh, in which uh, x difference s is matched to some uh, node in uh, gamma s, then I cannot put these two matchings together into one big matching for uh, complete matching for uh, x. And so that's what I'm trying to build, a complete matching for x uh, by pasting together these two matchings. So it's important that um, the, this, this new matching I'm going to find is from x minus s into x difference s into y difference gamma s. Okay. Um, so I'm looking for a complete matching from x difference s into y difference gamma s, the pink uh, region there. Okay, so why uh, why would I be able to find such a match? So um, we could use the induction hypothesis again and say, okay, look, this is a smaller set, this uh, x difference s. Uh, it's strictly smaller than x, so it is less than or equal to k in size. Uh, the induction hypothesis will tell me that all I need to prove is that for every subset here, uh, it's non-shrinking, then I'll be done. Okay. So for every subset T, if it's non-shrinking, since my X minus S is smaller, I would have, I, I would be able to use the induction hypothesis and say there is a perfect match. But the catch is that um, the graph we are talking about is between X difference S and Y difference gamma S. So what I need to prove is that for every subset T, if I looked at its neighborhood in the full graph, and you know, also say this thing, um, that is already guaranteed to be non-shrinking, uh, right? Uh, but that's not good enough. I want to look at the graph, uh, you know, that is restricted to the uh, y minus gamma s, and it's a priori quite possible that um, you know, even though the neighborhood of uh, T is larger. When you restrict that neighborhood to only the, uh, you know, uh, y minus gamma s, it could be get smaller, right? Um, so in fact, you know, this y the um, neighborhood of gamma the neighborhood of t um, could be arbitrarily could have an arbitrarily large intersection with uh, this gamma s. Okay, and what we are interested in showing is that after you remove that intersection, so gamma t difference gamma s is still larger than or equal to t. And if you just look at this guarantee for, you know, applied to t, it doesn't tell you much. It doesn't um, seem to give you a way forward. The trick uh, or the right way to look at this problem at this point is not to look at t, but to look at T union S. Okay, so let's look at T union S and apply this 
non-shrinking guarantee to it. So we know that, so you, uh, I'm calling it you, the two union S, okay, the blue region here. Uh, I'm calling it U and uh, that subset is exactly T plus S. So T is an arbitrary subset of uh, X differences, right? So T union S, you know, T and S are disjoint. So the size of T union S is exactly the size of T plus size of S. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, subset I'm going to look in the left. And on the right, there is some neighborhood of it in the original graph. Okay, and that neighborhood is guaranteed to be non-shrinking. So I'm going to look at, I have the guarantee that gamma u is greater than or equal to t plus s. Okay, now what I'm really interested in is just this part. Remember the neighborhood of t that is um, in a neighborhood of t difference neighborhood of s, right? So this part. But another way to think of that part is take this, um, you know, entire neighborhood of uh, uh, U and take the difference with uh, the set uh, gamma S, right? So the set gamma T difference gamma S that we are interested in is exactly the same as gamma U difference gamma S. So in gamma U, a bunch of new nodes could have appeared because a bunch of new nodes appeared in uh, U that were not in T and then their neighbors would appear in gamma U. But these extra nodes that appeared in U are all nodes in S, right? So um, their neighbors would all be in gamma S. So the additional uh, nodes that you find here, which are not in um, gamma uh, T, they are all there in um, uh, gamma S. So when you take the difference gamma U difference gamma S, it's the same as the difference gamma T difference gamma. Okay, any additional node you consider in U, gamma U gets removed by gamma S. Okay, so these two are the same sets. Uh, and that's the set here, right, this part. And now, what can we say about its size? Um, it's a size of, size of, it's a size of um, uh, some, uh, of a set difference, but gamma U contains gamma S, right? Gamma U is all of this uh, blue region. Um, it contains gamma s because u contains s. So this set difference is simply the difference of the, uh, or the size of the set difference is simply the difference of the set sizes. Uh, so it's gamma size of gamma u minus size of gamma s. Okay, and we already know something about size of gamma u. It is at least t plus s. And how about the size of gamma s? Well. Remember we said gamma s, what we need from s is just this, that gamma s is only as big as s, okay? It is not expanding. So this gamma s is equal to size of s and this is greater than or equal to t plus s. So the difference is greater than or equal to t, okay? So, uh, so it was important that since I'm doing a minus gamma s, what I need is a, uh, you know, an upper bound on the size of gamma s, saying something like gamma s is not expanding, okay, or s is not expanding. We are already told that s is not uh, shrinking, but, uh, you know, by choosing this s here, um, we, you know, an s which was shrinking in the smaller graph, we actually got the guarantee that s is not expanding, and that is what we needed here, okay. Um, Okay, so this, you know, put together says that uh, the, uh, for any subset T that you start with, its neighborhood restricted to Y difference gamma S is um, as big as, uh, at least as big as the set T. So it is not um, shrinking. And therefore, since that this holds for every subset T here, um, it's, uh, you can apply the induction hypothesis for smaller, um, uh, graphs and get that it is, um, there is a complete match. Okay. So I'm using strong induction here because, you know, the, uh, the smaller sets we are talking about could be, um, much smaller. Right? Um, okay. So, uh, so you do have this claim so that there is a complete match from X difference as to Y difference gamma and put together with this matching from, 
s to gamma s, we get a complete matching from x into y. All right, so that is, um, uh, you know, that's the entire proof of uh, Hall's theorem. So here's an example uh, of an application um, that you can, you know, result you can prove using uh, Hall's theorem. So the result says that, um, you know, consider a bipartite graph which is regular, namely uh, all the edges have the same degree, same number of, uh, sorry, all the nodes have the same degree, same number of edges incident on them. So the degree is D. Uh, then you can partition the set of edges into D perfect matches. Okay. Uh, so in, in such a graph uh, where both sides x and y have the same degree all the nodes have the same degree d the total number of edges you could think of it as all the edges leaving the set x so that would be d times the size of x you could also think of the nodes uh, the edges as all the edges uh, entering um, the set y and there are d times y because every node has uh, d edges in some on it okay. so uh, both these numbers are d times x and d times y are both the size of the edge set. Okay, so x and y are equal size, and um, there are uh, you know uh, the number of edges is d times x. If I consider a single perfect matching, it would its size is exactly you know the size right x or um, size of x or size of y. And um, if um, I were to find the disjoint perfect matchings, they would partition the entire edge set. So that's a claim that you can do it. Um, as an example, if you consider um, the hypercube graph, uh, Qn, then the uh, it's a bipartite graph and it's also regular. Every edge, every node has degree n. And so the claim here would be that it can, you can partition the edges into n sets. Uh, and perfect matches. And um, one way to see that quickly would be to consider edges along each dimension as forming a, a, a single perfect matching. Uh, edges along a single dimension means um, if you consider the nodes as bit strings, the edges corresponding to flipping the ith bit, all of them would give you uh, a single perfect matching. And um, you know there are n such perfect matchings. Okay, so that is an example, you know, it has a nice structure. You can quickly see it has a, a partition of the edges into um, perfect matchings. But even if you don't have all that nice structure, if you just have a much simpler structure here, namely it's a regular, it's a regular graph, it's a bipartite and regular graph, that would, you know, Hall's theorem would let you prove that it um, has the same effect of partitioning the edge set into perfect matchings. So let's see that. How would you prove it? We'll prove it by induction on uh, this degree d. The base case is d equal to one. So in this case, there is a, uh, you know, a single uh, edge leaving every node in x. And all the edges by themselves is then a complete matching of x into y. And since, uh, you know, uh, as we already saw, X and Y are the same size, this is a perfect matching. Um, in, in, and so D equal to one already gives you a single perfect matching. So that is what we wanted to prove. How about, uh, uh, you know, so suppose it holds for uh, D less than or equal to K. Um, and now given an arbitrary graph of degree d equal to k plus one, arbitrary bipartite regular graph of degree d equal to k plus one, what we're going to do is find one perfect matching. And once you find one perfect matching, if you remove it, what you're left with is a regular bipartite graph of degree uh, d minus one. So remember it remains uh, bipartite because you know, removing it just uh, doesn't affect that. And the degree becomes, uh, it still remains a you know, regular graph because by removing a matching, I removed one edge 
incident on every vertex, exactly one edge from every vertex, reduce thereby reducing its degree by exactly one. Right? So it, from degree d regular graph, it will become a degree d minus one regular graph. And then I can apply induction hypothesis to get, uh, you know, to partition the remaining edges into d minus one perfect matchings, and then combine it with this perfect matching I found and removed, I'll get um, the d perfect matching. So all that remains to be done is to find, show that there is one perfect matching, and then you can, you know, apply induction to uh, partition the remaining edges into uh, the remaining d minus one perfect matching. Okay, so how do you find one perfect matching? Uh, in the graph, we will use um, Hall's theorem. So, um, right, so to find a perfect matching, it's enough to show that there is no shrinking subset. That's what Hall's theorem says, um, or one direction of Hall's theorem, the more interesting direction of Hall's theorem says, it's enough to show that there is no shrinking subset that'll give, that'll show that there's a perfect matching, okay? And how do we know there is no shrinking subset? Turns out that's an easy consequence of um, the regularity. So what, you know, um, so take any arbitrary subset. I want to show it's not shrinking, subset of X. What are the, uh, you know, what's the total number of edges incident on uh, that subset? Uh, there are D edges leaving each element in the subset. There are D times S edges leaving that subset. Right? They're all edges going into the other part. Uh, and they're all going into its neighborhood, right? These are D times S edges are going into gamma S. But remember, the so the so the number of edges leaving S should be less than or equal to all the edges coming into gamma S from S and from elsewhere. Um, so you know this inequality holds. But remember, the number of edges um, that are coming into gamma s is exactly d times gamma s because it's regular on the other side also with the same d. d times s less than or equal to d times gamma s or gamma s is greater than or equal to s. Okay. And then by Hall's theorem, there is a perfect matching and uh, inductively that will give you the result you want to do. Okay. So there are several other um, you know interesting um, results with similar flavor that you would uh, be able to prove using Hall's theorem. Um, and uh, uh, it, Hall's theorem itself has a very simple and uh, uh, elegant proof.